guys, welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're new here. Today is going to be another in the quick pathophysiology series, although we're going to cover quite a bit more than pathophysiology for peptic ulcer disease. We're going to talk about risk factors, some health promotion and nutrition and some treatments as well as medications. So stay tuned if that sounds interesting to you. Okay, so peptic ulcer disease is the erosion of the mucosal lining of the stomach or the duodenum. So if we have an ulcer in the stomach, otherwise known as a gastric ulcer, it's most common in the antrum, which is the lower portion of the stomach. Or if it's in the duodenum, it is more in the upper portion of the duodenum. The duodenum is the most common type of peptic ulcer. Now this erosion causes the epithelium to be exposed to gastric acid and pepsin. And that can of course lead to bleeding and perforation which perforation could lead to peritonitis and septic shock and bleeding could lead to hypovolemic shock. Those would all be medical emergencies. Now, if I'm using the words gastric acid and pepsin and the different parts of the stomach and the small intestine, and you're a little bit unfamiliar with those, I will link in the cards above a video that I filmed earlier this week just on nutrition basics. So you're going to learn all about ingestion, digestion, metabolism, and absorption of nutrients. And you'll also learn chemical and mechanical digestion and all of the different pieces and parts of the GI tract if you're interested. I'll also link that video down in the description box below. However, let's get back to peptic ulcer disease. Now we can have lots of causes of peptic ulcer disease, although the most common are an infection. And this is typically a gram negative bacteria called Heliacobacter pylori or H pylori, which can be found in food, water, or in body fluids. Now we also see peptic ulcers caused by stress. So burns, that's called a curling's ulcer shock, sepsis, trauma, especially of the head or brain. Those are called Cushing's ulcer. And then we do see high incidence of stress-related ulcers in ventilated patients. Now you'll often see that we try to prevent those with a proton pump inhibitor. Now we also see ulcers caused by long-term use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. We can see it caused by gastritis. Gastric ulcers are caused by delayed stomach emptying or gastric emptying and duodenal ulcers are caused by rapid gastric emptying. And then with the duodenal ulcer genetics plays a part as well. So how do we prevent ulcers? Well, we can limit alcohol, caffeine, avoid tobacco, try to avoid or at least limit the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, good stress management techniques. Now we can't always prevent physical stress on the body, especially as it relates to trauma, but emotional stress that can also cause ulcers. So we can work to eliminate that type or reduce that type of stress, a balanced diet and regular exercise. Clinical manifestations. So dyspepsia is epigastric burning pain. That's heartburn. We also can experience bloating, nausea, and vomiting. Now there are some differences between the pain that is felt with a gastric ulcer and a duodenal ulcer. So gastric ulcer pain, these are the good test questions. Pain is going to be 30 to 60 minutes after eating, and that pain is going to get worse when we eat. Clients are often malnourished, experiencing weight loss and anorexia. And if these ulcers are bleeding, it will be present in the vomitus. Duodenal ulcers, on the other hand, pain will occur about one and a half to three hours after a meal. And that makes sense, right? Because food has to travel all the way through the stomach and then hit the small intestine. Pain is going to be worse at night and pain is often relieved by eating food. These clients tend to be well-nourished, and if we do have bleeding from a duodenal ulcer, it will be present in the stool, so dark, sticky, tarry stools, that's called melina. Now, an EGD is the most accurate diagnostic tool for peptic ulcer disease. Let's learn a bit more about the EGD procedure. Let's begin by reviewing information about your body. The gastrointestinal GI tract begins with the mouth. This tract or path for digestion continues past the throat to the esophagus, a tube that carries food to the stomach. In the stomach, pieces of food are broken down further. These partially digested bits then pass to the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine. Together, these structures are considered the upper GI tract. EGD stands for the medical name of the procedure. E stands for esophagus, 
G for gastro, which means stomach, and D for duodenum. This procedure is done using a long flexible instrument called a scope that has a light and camera at the tip. When necessary, tools can be guided through the scope to biopsy and treat this hard to reach area of the body. During this procedure, the lining of the upper GI tract is inspected to investigate symptoms and complaints, such as difficulty swallowing and heartburn, abnormal tests, commonly anemia, and other suspected disease, such as celiac disease, ulcers, or cancer. Suspicious lesions may be removed or biopsied. If tissue samples are collected, they are sent to a pathology lab for examination. An EGD can be recommended as necessary to treat some problems. With an EGD, a doctor is often able to stop severe upper GI bleeding. In other situations, food chunks and other stuck objects can be reached and gently removed. An EGD can also be used to stretch and dilate an esophagus that is narrow from scar tissue or other problems. Now let's look closer at the EGD procedure. To start, you will be positioned comfortably and given medication to help you relax or sleep during the procedure. A scope is gently guided through your mouth and throat then down your esophagus to your stomach. You may feel some pressure or tugging, but you shouldn't feel pain. And further to the first part of the small intestine. The walls of the upper digestive tract are carefully inspected. Small lesions may be removed for testing. After all of the surfaces have been examined, biopsies and necessary treatments completed, the scope is withdrawn. There is some other lab testing that we can do. Um, but the majority of it is for H. pylori, so there are a couple of different ways we can test for that bacteria. The first would be a biopsy of gastric tissue during an EGD procedure, and then we could culture that tissue for the H. pylori bacteria. We can also do what's called a urea breath test. This is where the client will swallow a capsule liquid or pudding containing urea and a special carbon atom. And then a few minutes later, they exhale into a container. And then if that carbon atom is present in the breath, then that bacteria H. pylori is present. We can also test stool for H. pylori antigens, or we can test blood for H. pylori antibodies. Now, the other types of testing we might do would be related to bleed. Eating. So, of course, we would see a decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit, and we could have stool that was positive for occult blood. There are some surgical interventions for peptic ulcer disease, although these are typically used in clients who do not experience healing or resolution of ulcers within about three to four months of treatment, or if the client is experiencing hemorrhage, has a perforation, or has pyloric obstruction, which is another complication of peptic ulcer disease. So a gastrectomy, we can remove all or part of the stomach. So an antrectomy is where the lower portion of the stomach only is removed. Remember, that's the most common location of gastric ulcers. We can also do what's called a gastrojejunostomy, where the lower portion of the stomach is removed, and then the remaining stomach is anastomosed to the jejunum, and then the duodenum is completely closed off and eliminated. The vagotomy is where the vagus nerve is cut, and that will decrease gastric acid production in the stomach. And then a pyloroplasty is where we open uh, the area further between the stomach and small intestine called the pylorus. It's enlarged. That will increase the rate of gastric emptying, and that is a treatment for pyloric obstruction. Now, the three biggest complications of peptic ulcer disease are perforation, hemorrhage, those are medical emergencies, and the pyloric obstruction. So let's talk about the emergencies first. So with perforation and hemorrhage, severe epigastric pain, it is going to spread across, across the abdomen. It is possibly going to radiate to the right shoulder. We will also see initially very hyperactive bowel sounds, and eventually those bowel sounds are going to be diminished and absent. The abdomen will be board-like, rigid, and very tender. 
we will see signs of hypovolemic shock during bleeding and signs of septic shock during perforation. Now, signs of shock could be hypotension, tachycardia, of course, as perfusion diminishes, confusion, dizziness, syncope. We will also see a decreased H&H. Uh, we could also see bleeding in the vomitus or in the stool. And then of course, your priority as a nurse is airway, breathing, circulation. So oxygenation, this might include intubation and ventilation, as well as volume replacement that could be fluid or blood or a combination of the two to treat hypovolemic shock. Of course, if this is peritonitis from a perforation, we would also need antibiotic. Pyloric obstruction, again, caused by scarring, edema, or spasming of the pyloric sphincter, and this prevents the stomach from emptying, so it really drastically affects peristalsis. The client will feel full, distended, nauseous, and they might even vomit undigested food. The treatment for pyloric obstruction, before we jump straight to surgery, which we talked about on the previous slide, which would be pyloroplasty, we could try decompression with a nasogastric tube. Now, if you need to know a little bit more about nasogastric tubes, I did do a video all on enteral feeding, also on the skill of inserting a nasogastric tube. So if you would like to watch that video, I will link it down in the description box below. Okay, guys, that's all I have on content, but I do have a study guide. It's actually a compare and contrast all about first and foremost, peptic ulcer disease, but then comparing and contrasting gastric and duodenal ulcers. If you're interested in that product, it is available in my Etsy shop. I will link it down in the description box below, as well as a coupon code that you can use if you're interested in that product. Now, I do have a couple of questions that we can check your understanding. A nurse in the emergency department is assessing a client with suspected stomach perforation due to a peptic ulcer. Which finding should the nurse expect? And this is a select all that apply. So answers to this question are a rigid abdomen, tachycardia, and abdominal tenderness. So perforation is going to lead to bleeding, hypovolemia, and possibly peritonitis and sepsis. So you would see hypotension. And of course, as your perfusion is impaired, central cyanosis. A nurse is completing an assessment of a client who has a gastric ulcer, which finding should the nurse expect? And this is once again, a select all that apply. So of course, this question requires you to know the difference between a gastric and a duodenal ulcer. And so the answers to this question are sensation of bloating, patient reports sensation of bloating. So that's dyspepsia. Pain with a gastric ulcer is going to occur 30 minutes to one hour after a meal. So with the duodenal ulcer, it'll be one and a half to three hours after a meal. And then pain upon palpation of the epigastric region. Pain relieved by eating is a duodenal ulcer. Also pain occurs mostly at night or at night is a duodenal ulcer. Okay, guys, that's all the quick content I have for you today on peptic ulcer disease. Hopefully you found it helpful to differentiate between gastric and duodenal ulcers. Again, I do have that compare and contrast study guide. I will link it down in the description box below. And you can always find me on Twitter and Instagram. I am posting daily on those platforms. If you have any questions, please leave them down in a comment box below, or you can reach out to me via email. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next video.